don't have a specific scripture reading of John today. I'm going to include that in the message uh, this morning. So we're going to go straight to our, our message for today. Well, for years, we know that especially those in Germany, but Christians around the world have been preparing for the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. We know that this weekend that Christians everywhere are celebrating the man who nailed the 95 Thesis on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. That was a common thing to do, actually, in Luther's day. The community bulletin board was the church door. So people would put things on there that they wanted them to see and discuss. And oftentimes they would put questions of theological debate to be up on those doors. So this wasn't an abnormal thing for Luther to do. These are really 95 questions for debate. But no one knew that the firestorm that these 95 theses would create, no one knew the Reformation in Germany and the world that would follow. And really what got Luther in trouble was that the 95 Thesis, in the end, truly questioned the authority of the Pope and questioned certain findings that the Pope had legislated within the church. Now, Luther never wanted to start a new church. He loved the church of his day. He simply wanted the church of his day to go through reforming, like we many times do as individuals, to get back on track with God because he believed that many of the things that the church was believing and also practicing in his day was not according to the will of God. Now, some people may think that this anniversary is not that big of a deal, but I would not agree with them. In a devotion earlier this month on the Lutheran Hour Ministries, Pastor Ken Kloss asked the question, is Martin Luther really that big of a deal? And then he goes on to share this devotion. In that devotion, he shared that there was a TV series biography over the past year that did a countdown of the 100 most influential people over the past thousand years. Now, do you know who was first? Well, it wasn't Luther, all right? I just want to let you know that. It was Johannes Gutenberg, who was the inventor of the movable type press. And what Johannes Gutenberg did is he really created a printing revolution that allowed for the mass production of books and writings in massive quantities and quicker than ever had been seen in history. Many people believe that it was this invention that helped Luther succeed and God through him because 100 years before Luther, there was a Catholic priest by the name of John Huss who had many of the same views as Luther, but he ended up being burned at the stake as a heretic. But because Luther was able to put his beliefs and findings in the words of the people so quickly and so massively, many people believe that's why the Reformation succeeded. Now, do you know who was the second most influential person over the last thousand years? Well, sorry, it wasn't Luther. What it was or who it was was Isaac Newton who contributed to physics and math and the far reaches in the universe. But who was third? Yeah, Luther. Third's not so bad. This guy who wasn't a scientist, who never led an army, who never ruled a country, who never painted a masterpiece, he was third. Now, you may think that's kind of a lofty position for someone who simply nailed 95 topics for debate upon a church door. And if that is all that Luther did, it would still be worth mentioning. But he did much more. He gave people the Bible in their own language. That was very important. He was someone who promoted education and wrote music and did things that touched almost every aspect of religious and secular life. But I would say to you today that of all of the things that God did through Martin Luther, the most important thing that he did is that he used Luther to call the Christian church back to three core beliefs. Those beliefs are on that little Celtic symbol that you were given when you came in. If you didn't get one, get one on your way out to put on your keychain. So today I'm gonna to talk about sola scriptura, sola gratia, and sola fide. The first is Luther called the church back to scripture alone. What we believe, what Luther put forth is that the Bible, the canon, is the measuring stick for all that we are to believe not only about God, but what we are to believe about how we are to live. 
that it is the Bible that is the clearest picture of God's will. And Luther said from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is a love story, a love story about how God is always working to bring us back into a right relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And so in Luther's day, there was kind of a battle going on. What had more authority in people's lives? Was it the tradition of the church or was it the revelation of the scripture? Because they seemed to be butting heads. Let me give an example. The custom of indulgences in Luther's day. You could go and hear someone speak and they would then offer you a piece of paper that was signed by the Pope that said if you paid your money, you could then receive this paper that said your sins are forgiven. And Luther had trouble with that. He, he says in his temple talk, you know, can I buy my forgiveness like I can go down into the market and buy a sack of potatoes? And if I can buy my forgiveness, then why in the world did Jesus Christ need to come and give his life for me? So he said, look, the teachings of the church don't match up with the Holy Scriptures, so I have trouble with what the church is believing and how the church is practicing its faith. That is a guide for each one of us because... The Bible is to be the standard for what we believe and how we are to live. And if we can't find things in God's word, if the media or if our society or other people are telling us certain things, and those things are a word or a belief or a lifestyle that we are to live, and we can't find it in the word, then folks, that's when we need to say what? The word or tradition and to hold on to the word and to struggle with that and to work through that in our lives. In 2 Timothy, it says, all scripture is God-breathed. What Martin Luther believed is that the Bible was not a collection of stories. It was not a collection of beliefs or myths or human ideas about God. It was not a human book. Through the Holy Spirit, God revealed who he is and what his plan is and what his will is. And he worked through people to write it down, breathed into, we call, they were inspired. They still used their own personal and historical and cultural context. They still used their own minds and their language and style, but God worked through them and they wrote down what God wanted them to write. So that is why one, scripture for us is trustworthy. And two, it is authoritative because it is the revelation of God's will for life. But even more important than just the whole Bible, Martin Luther would say there is a word within the word that you really need to focus on. And that word within the word is Jesus Christ. Take a look at John chapter one. It says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He, now I always say this, That's the only place in the Bible where the personal pronoun he is attached back to the word. It is telling us that this word who was part of creation, this word that was with the father, this word that then would ultimately come among us, he is a person and he is Jesus Christ and through him all things were made. Uh, John goes on to tell us that the person who was part of our creation is also the one, the God who came to be among us. In verse 14 of John's gospel, the first chapter, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory, glory of the one and only, which means he's unique, no one else like him, full of grace and truth. You see, before Jesus came, what the Bible says is we only partially saw God. But now that Jesus has come, we fully have seen God because God is visible and tangible before us. He is the ultimate revelation of God. Jesus is a living picture of God among us. He is the perfect expression of God among us. Now, the impact that that ought to have in our lives is if he is the perfect revelation of God, then he is the one that we ought to go to. First of all, to go to when it comes to what we think or what we believe, because he then is the perfect teacher. When we go to Jesus, we see how God thinks, and it is revealed how God wishes for us to think. And Philippians, we read, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. When we go to Christ, we also see how we ought to live. He's the perfect example. 
what the Bible tells us is that Jesus Christ is the model for which we are to strive for, the person that we wish and desire to become. In 1 Peter 2, it says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. And because he is God among us, we go to him because it is through him that we are shown how we are saved. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. We are told in the Bible that he came to sacrifice himself for our sins and that his death satisfies the requirements of God our Father. It's in Colossians that we read that it is through Jesus that we are reconciled to him. How? By the peace that his blood shed for us that is brought to us. We are called to be a people of sola scriptura. We are to be a people who are of scripture alone. We base everything we believe, we base how we are to live, we base our understanding of God on the scriptures alone. The second thing that God calls us back to through Luther is grace alone. Now, I've had three people the whole week and say they remember this illustration. I've used it in Bible studies all the time, probably in church before. Who remembers my story about Dennis the Menace? Ben, come on. Uh, <laughs> all right, let me share it. Because I think it em emphasizes grace. Dennis, we know, was a menace to the Wilsons, especially next door. And there's a cartoon that shows Dennis and a buddy of his walking away from Mrs. Wilson. Mrs. Wilson has a basket of chocolate chip cookies in her arm. And as she stands amongst the door frame and they walk away, they're already eating the cookies she gave them, chocolates flying everywhere. And Dennis's friend then says to him, he says, Dennis, what in the world did we do right, to get Mrs. Wilson to give us cookies like this? And Dennis says to his buddy, haven't you learned by now? Mrs. Wilson gives us cookies. She's nice to us, not because of who we are, but because of who she is. That's grace. That's grace. That is how God comes to us. That is how God treats us. God comes to us with his love and his mercy and gives it to us, offers it to us, not because of who we are. It is simply because of who he is. We define grace as God's free. Didn't cost us anything, cost him greatly in giving his son. Grace is God's free, undeserved, if each one of us would go before God, we would stand before God's righteous deserved judgment and condemnation because of who we have been. So when he comes and gives us grace, it is undeserved and it is, is his gift of love. Now, a lot of times people would say to me, when it comes to how God forgives us and we're to forgive, people will say, boy, pastor, it's hard to forgive other people. I mean, if, you, if it's easy to forgive, you raise your hand today. It's not an easy thing. But many times people will say to me, I can't forgive this person because they do not deserve it. And I usually will say, exactly. Forgiveness is for people who don't deserve it because that is how God treats us. And when it comes to God's grace, I love what Matt Chandler, a Baptist minister in Texas says, it's on the screen. God has seen our unloveliness the deep brokenness and rebellion in our hearts. And instead of withdrawing, this is great, he pursues us to the very end. God is the one who takes the initiative. God is the one who came into this world. God is the one who seeks us out. God is like a shepherd who goes after that one sheep that is lost. He is like the father who runs out of the house and runs to the prodigal son. And before the prodigal son can say a word, he embraces him. God is like the woman who searches for that lost coin in the house and turns it upside down until she finds it. She will not be satisfied until she finds what was lost. That's God. He will not be satisfied until he can come to us with his grace to find we who are lost so that we might be found. And we call that the gospel. We call that the good news. The gospel is for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It was said that Martin Luther was observing a painting of the crucifixion of Jesus. And then he was deeply moved, so deeply moved, that then he said, 
my God, my God, for me, for me. Now, when we talk about the gospel and the good news, what came out of the Reformation was also an emphasis to understand a good balance between what we call both the law and the gospel. The greatest example of the law, God's expectations of us would be the Ten Commandments. And oftentimes people will come to me and say, well, the law is the Old Testament and the gospel is the New Testament. Well, I'm sorry to blow your bubble. That's not true. There's just as much gospel in the Old Testament as in the New, just as much law in the New Testament as there is in the Old. Well, didn't the people of old live by the law? That's not true either. Remember, God came to the Israelites And when God came to them, he established a relationship with them through promise and grace. The commandments then came what? Way, way down the road. God came to Abraham and said, look, because Abraham was worried he would not have any descendants. And God said that you will have a child with your wife, Sarah, and your descendants will be as many stars in the sky. So shall your offspring be. And the relationship with God began with God's promises and his love and his mercy and his choosing of Abraham and the Israelite people. And so I want to say this to you. The commandments have never changed anyone's heart. And that is not their purpose. Their purpose is to reveal God's will. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy will be done. The commandments then give us a picture of what actually that will is. And in doing so, the commandments then provide us what? The parameters and the boundaries in which we are to live. And when we live by them, we'll be given safety and security and we will be given blessings in our life. But God reveals his will to counter our sinful will. But the commandments not only reveal God's will, what what do they do? They will reveal our sin. Because as soon as we look, boy, this is how God wants me to live, many times we'll say, oop, I'm not living that way. I'm not living up to his standard. The commandments will show us how unfaithful we are with God. In John's gospel, the fourth and fifth verse of the first chapter, it says this, in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Many times we may not even know that we're sinning until God's what law comes and says, this is how I'd like you to live, and we say, oops, Or it's not until what? God shines the light of his expectations into the darkness of our lives. And when God's light shines and shows ourselves for who we truly are, then we realize that we are sinners. And we are sinners very much in need of a savior. And because of this, it should free us from any thinking that we could ever get right with God by anything that we do whether it be services that we do or intelligent choices that we make or abilities we have. Many times I have found when I walk into a funeral home that people will try to comfort one another when someone has passed who is not a person of faith. And what you will hear time and time again is said, boy, he was a good person. Being a good person will not get you saved. What we are told in the scriptures And Isaiah is that all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. When Luther passed away, they found this note, this scrap of paper in one of his pants pockets. We are beggars. This is true. Luther knew in life and in death, we depend solely, solely on the mercy of God. And so what's the result? When we realize we're sinners, it's Martin Luther who would say the result of that, the effect that that should have on us is then that should send us running, actually sprinting to the gospel. It should send us to the foot of the cross to kneel, to know then that we are in need of only what the love and the mercy and grace that God can provide through his son, Jesus Christ. See, to me, the commandments, their purpose is to move us from unfaith to faith. One of the favorite verses of Luther was Ephesians 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one may boast. 
Scripture alone, grace alone. And then Luther would say faith alone. If grace is God's way towards us, then faith is our response. In the catechism, he describes faith as holding on to, grasping on to, trusting and believing in the promises of God. Abraham, Abraham, descendants will be as many as the stars. And then verse six, I didn't share it earlier, Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God's first relationship with his people in Scripture and then all the way through has always been based on his grace, his choosing people, and then them believing in him, having faith in his promises. In John chapter 14, we are told that yet to all who did receive Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Martin Luther, I believe, in the catechism says there are three things about faith. Don't forget, first, faith is believing and trusting in God's promises. But the second is, is that faith, faith means that God will change you. Faith means as you trust in God, as you allow him to come in, that your life will be different and your life won't be the same. When we receive Jesus as our Lord, we are told that we are reborn spiritually, that we are new creations, that we are given a new life. Actually, the Bible says an abundant life in Jesus Christ. And as we experience this new birth, we are to be a changed person. Actually, folks, we are to be changing persons, people, every day in our lives as we're moving towards who God wants us to be. And so this new birth in Christ will challenge us. And Jesus will also help us then, challenge us and help us to rearrange our attitudes if they need to be rearranged, to change our motives if they need to be changed, to adjust our priorities if they need to be adjusted. We are told as Christians who follow Jesus, people of the Holy Spirit, that every single day that we live with Jesus Christ, he will give us a chance for a fresh and new start. That's what he gives us as we trust in him and as he comes into our life to make us to be that new creation. Faith is believing, but faith is also meaning to change. And faith, the third thing would mean is that faith is just not a belief, but it is a life. It is living. Again, John 14, it says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light. And throughout the whole New Testament, what we are told is that that's our role too, that God wishes for us to be a testifier of the light so that people might see the light, experience the light in and through us. God has chosen us for that. And why would we want to do that? Not because the pastor says we should, not because someone twists our arm, not because we're made to feel guilty, but we live out our faith because that is based on gratitude. Gratitude of the free love of Jesus Christ. And that is what sends us forth with servanthood and kindness and love for other people. God God did not intend for our actions for them to uh, help us to obtain salvation, but God does intend that our salvation lead us to have actions towards the love of others. And we need to remember, we are not merely saved for our own benefit, but we are saved, one, to serve Christ, and two, to build up his church. Martin Luther says it this way, What is it to serve God and do his will? Nothing else than to show mercy to our neighbor. For it is our neighbor who needs our service. God in heaven needs it not. I always get caught up in, well, I'm gonna serve somebody, right? Because God, you need me to do that. No, Luther is saying, God doesn't need you to serve. He's God. The person in front of you. That should be motivation enough. They need you to serve them. And so I'm going to end with each theme and a quote from Scripture, or actually a quote from Martin Luther today. Scripture alone, Luther said, the Bible is alive, it speaks to me. It has feet, it runs after me. It has hands, 
it lays hold of me. Is your life a scripture alone life? Has it taken hold of you? How about grace alone? Luther says that the creator himself comes to us and becomes our ransom. This is the reason for our rejoicing. And really, why do you rejoice in life? Deep down, is it because you know God has loved you? I mean, really. And if not, then maybe some adjustments need to occur. And faith alone, Luther says, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain that a person could stake their life on it a thousand times. Well, don't worry about a thousand times today. I think what's most important is if you and I stake our future on it today. Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, in our lives for your grace that has come to us through the cross. And we thank you for leading us with your Holy Spirit to faith in you. Lord, we pray for not just a celebration of reformation today throughout the world. We pray right here, starting with us, that we would be reformed as we recommit ourselves to your word as we celebrate your love for us and as we trust and believe in you, recommit ourselves to you again uh, to live and to love according to your will. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Trinity Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. And you could also be a big help to us if you'd go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and God bless.